start off today and then um, switch to Morag later on. Um, and as Kate mentioned, this is part of a book that Lee Fay and Kate Laver edited um, a little while ago, and um, I contributed to the physical function and dementia chapter. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge the other co-authors who are actually from Canada, um, Susan Muir and Manuel Montero Dasso, who contributed to that. So this is kind of the overview of today. I'm going to talk a little bit about what is physical function, why it's important, what happens in people with dementia compared to people who don't have dementia, some of the interventions to maintain physical function, and I'm really going to focus on exercise. Um, there are a whole lot of other things that can be done to support physical function, such as devices, technology. Um, there's even some experimental medications, but I'm going to really focus on exercise today. Morag will talk about falls and um, then we'll finish up with some specific tips and future directions. So I'll try and keep an eye on the time as well. <laughs> Quite a lot to cover. So what is physical function? Um, physical function can really cover a wide range of things from people's strength, balance, coordination, reaction time, to walking and climbing stairs. Um, I've, as I mentioned, been really interested in how people walk and what contributes to walking, particularly the brain and thinking. Um, the other great thing about walking is it's really easy to measure um, in the community, in clinics, anywhere really and you just need a measured distance a stopwatch and then you can just calculate distance divided by time so for example if you've got 10 minutes and you 10 meters and you take 15 seconds you can calculate the walking speed so in this case 0.66 meters per second and I just want you to try and remember that um, for later on because I talk about walking speed a couple of times during the presentation so why is physical function important? Well, um, I was at a talk yesterday and someone said, what, what is kind of your impression of health? And um, when I thought about it, I thought, well, it's being able to do the things that I want to do well. And um, so I suppose physical function is just that in really um, ability to be able to do the things that you want to do, but it also has other um, benefits. So being able to walk um, and do exercise is important for heart health. Everybody knows that. Um, but of course, what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. And we now know that being able to move um, and do exercise and walking can have benefits for the blood flow to the brain and even neuroplasticity. Being able to move about and walk is also helpful for sleep. So. Um, if we kind of make ourselves a little bit tired during the day, it can help with sleep, but it's also important for mood. And that can be through the impact on the brain, but also being able to get out and um, meet with other people and socialise, which of course is such a huge issue at the moment, um, particularly in Australia in lockdown with COVID. So the other thing that's really important with physical function is being able to do activities of daily living, whether that's getting in and out of the shower, um, going to the toilet, dressing. So physical function is important for all of these things as well. But of course, it's also important for being able to do things that we enjoy, such as playing golf or bowls or whatever activities that we like to go out and do. I'm going to come back to that walking speed. So around about a walking speed of 0.4 metres per second is what we kind of need to be able to efficiently do the activities of daily living and mobilise around the house. And interestingly, I'm not sure in other countries, but in Australia, you need to be able to walk at a speed of around 1.2 metres per second to cross the road at the traffic lights. Um, although around hospitals and nursing homes, it is a little, you're allowed to walk a little bit slower, so around one metre per second. So we do need reasonable walking speed to be able to function in our house and community efficiently. If we have poor mobility, poor mobility or walking speeds of around 0.8 to 1 metre per second or less have been associated with falls, hospitalisation and even nursing home admission. So we do need to be able to walk at a reasonable walking speed for um, health. It's a good marker of overall health. So if you just remember that 0.8 to 1 metre per second, I'm going to come back to that in another slide as well. And here we are. So what happens um, to physical functioning people with dementia? And so this was something that I've been really interested in. 
So this is um, data from a memory clinic where there were people who turned up and got various diagnoses. So um, some didn't get a di diagnosis at all, and that's the black uh, line here. Some had a diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and then mild dementia and moderate dementia. And what you can see is the walking speed is slower the more severe the diagnosis for that preferred walking speed. And it was similar when we asked people to walk at a fast walking speed as well. But I think what's really interesting, although walking speed is able to differentiate between the different diagnoses, so it might be a good marker of brain function, the really important thing is the people who had dementia were walking at speeds on average less than that one metre per second that's predictive of adverse outcomes, and also at speeds that meant that it would be difficult to get across the road in time and mobilise in the community. So I guess what I'm trying to show is that it's really important um, that we try and make sure that people are able to mobilise as well as possible. So what might contribute to this slower walking speed um, and poorer mobility? Well, this is work by Morag. Um, and she looked at people with cognitive impairment and those without cognitive impairment and found that those with cognitive impairment had poorer balance, poorer strength, slower reaction time, and um, poorer performance on visual spatial function. And these are all physical functions that are important for mobilising in the community um, or mobility in general. So what about the brain? Could the brain actually have an impact on mobility and physical functioning as well? So we do know that um, the areas of the brain for motor and sensory function are important for mobility. But this is some work I did back in 2014. And really interestingly, areas of the brain that are important for thinking and memory, so attention, planning and judgment in this frontal area, but also in the hippocampal area, which is important for memory, was associated with slower walking speeds. So even these changes in the brain might be impacting on people's mobility and physical function. And so this is another study that I did that actually looked at the different domains of cognitive functioning and looked at whether it was they were associated with slower walking speed. And they were. And so I guess just to give you some examples of how the brain and thinking is important for walking. I've got these pictures to demonstrate. So for example, in this first picture, you would need to have good planning to work out the route to go through all these different cracks in the pavement. You could need good judgment about your own ability, whether it was safe to do so, and good physiospatial skills so that you wouldn't um, trip on the cracks in the pavement. You need to have good attention to walk. And this is um, something that most of us, I'm sure, will have seen um, people walking with their phone and then uh, running into a pole or tripping and spraining their ankle. It's something as physios we see uh, quite commonly. So be, that ability to being able to divide attention is really important. And that's that frontal area of the brain. And this um, picture on the right-hand side is one of my favourites. The lady... Um, is looking down at her feet. So because she's probably got poor balance or poor sensory function, she's having to really concentrate and pay attention to her walking. If she was bumped, um, she would also have to have good reaction time, but she would also need to be able to divide her attention and take, um, I guess, look around her and be able to take into account all the different people that are crossing the road there. And that's a very famous crossing in Japan um, if anyone's ever been there, when the lights go off, music blares out, lights go off. And so there's a lot of concentration that would need to be taken for this lady to cross the road. We also need to be able to navigate um, around in our community and so to find the way. And what can happen sometimes with people um, whose memory or visual spatial skills um, is poorer than in they may not want to leave home and then this becomes a little bit of a vicious circle and that's I guess what I'm trying to show here is that um, people may stay home because they're unable to find their way or they're embarrassed about going out and so their physical activity starts to decline um, it can lead to loneliness and so it's really important that we try and maintain people's participation in activities to maintain physical function as well. 
I'm going to move on to um, interventions to improve physical function. And as I mentioned, um, it's not just about exercise. So there are um, devices such as walking aids and gait aids, and that's a whole nother um, presentation really about when to bring in gait aids, um, particularly if some people have cognitive impairment. There are various technologies to help people navigate in the community or if they um, get lost, so to support safety in the community. There's also a great um, website, and I'm sure there's lots of websites around the world that talk about good signage and um, ways that the environment can be um, changed or um, assisted to help people with dementia um, safely navigate comfortably in the community. And as I mentioned, the chapter that we wrote also has a section on medications, which um, are, have been shown in experiments to um, improve physical function, although these are very experimental and a lot of them have unwanted side effects. So really there's not a lot that are being used in clinical practice at the moment. So the really important and great news is that there is really good evidence now that exercise can improve physical function in people with dementia. And if you're interested in the, um, the actual article, this is it down here by Freddie Lamb in the Journal of Phys Physiotherapy. And so what he did was he looked at all the different clinical trials that have been done in the area. So there were 43 that he found um, with 3,988 people. And he combined them all in what we call a systematic review and meta-analysis. And what he found overall was that exercise can improve things like strength, balance, um, and mobility. So all the things that um, you know, are a problem sometimes in people with um, dementia and cognitive impairment. So this is a message that we've really got to get out that um, people with dementia can improve their physical function um, and exercise is a great way to do it. So what about the principles of exercise? So from that systematic review, he found that something called multimodal exercise is helpful. And really what this means is that exercises of all different types, um, as long as they're personalized and of sufficient intensity are effective. And so what are some of those types? Um, so the different types of exercise, most people know what aerobic exercises is. That's when you huff and puff, um, and it's good for your heart and lungs and your brain. So that type of exercise we think is particularly good for brain health because it gets the blood flowing. Resistance exercises when you lift weights or use your muscles. And so this is actually a really good exercise for people that um, are unable to walk, for example, or even don't like huffing and puffing. Um, and you can do it at home. So it's quite simple as well. Um, good for particularly people with diabetes. Again, surprisingly, some people might not know that it's actually really good for heart health as well. But resistance exercises, particularly if they're functional, which is the picture on the far right, um, can be great for just everyday function. So even just standing up from a chair strengthens the legs or step ups are really great for being able to go up and down stairs. And then this one, the balance one, this is a pretty high level balance one. The balance is um, great, for, particularly for um, mobility and falls, and Morag might talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think the important thing to, to think about, um, which I'll go into a little bit more, um, is that you really need to do the type of exercise that you want to improve. So it needs to be specific um, and personalised in terms of intensity for the person. Duration, it needs to be more than three months, two or more times per week for 60 minutes. Um, but really like to argue that you want to be exercising. Everybody wants to be exercising over the lifetime. Um, we're doing some work at the moment looking at childhood um, fitness and health. And interestingly, those with better fitness in particularly aerobic and resistance training have better cognitive fun function at midlife. So starting young um, is another message we need to get out there. Um, but if you don't know where to start or you, you, you're just starting out, um, even just reducing sitting time can be great. We sit for long periods of the day, particularly um, as researchers, we're tied to our computers these days with Zoom. And so getting up and walking about is really important. Um, 
some people talk about 30 minutes a day. It doesn't need to be done all at once. It can be done in short 10-minute sessions a couple of times a day. So it can be broken up. It's really what suits, suits you. Um, often when um, I've prescribed exercises to people at home, I try and tie them to their activities of daily living. So while you're boiling the kettle for a cup of tea, you might just want to raise up onto your toes a few times or while watching tea, you can do the sit to stand exercises. So tying it into your day is useful. But of course, if you go for a walk, going with others can always help motivate you so you know that you're going to meet someone. Probably the biggest measure is just try and um, when you're starting out to do what you enjoy. If um, you have pre-existing medical conditions that you're concerned about um, or you're not sure, um, always seeing a physiotherapist and an exercise physiologist to personalise the exercise can be really useful. Um, and it's always good to set goals as well. Um, as long as they're achievable, um, that can always keep people motivated as well. And um, that might be just doing the exercises each day, or it could be a goal that you want to be able to um, walk down to the shop um, and reach that distance. And it might be setting a training program to do that. Um, but the important message really is that every move counts. And um, I think even just sitting down and listening to um, a talk now for 25 minutes can be tiring. The blood flow to our brain um, slows down a little bit. So if you feel comfortable before I hand over to Morag, um, you might wanna just stand up for 30 seconds and get that blood flow going, even taking a, a couple of steps on the spot don't have to but it always wakes me up in the middle of a, um, a talk and um, gets my brain ready for the second half <laughs> so it's as simple as that so I'm just going to give a little bit of a summary on um, falls uh, in people with dementia um, and so on this slide what we're showing and and obviously when we talk about the research that's been done um, we talk about it um, from what we find from the population study. So not everything I'm gonna say is relevant for everyone here because everybody's different. Um, so I just wanted to start by, by saying that. But what we do know is that when we look at um, people with dementia, that more people fall each year than people without dementia. So it, depend, it can vary depending on the type of dementia you have, but at least about 60 to 80 percent of people with dementia have one fall or more each year and that's compared to about 30 or 40 percent in people without dementia and then if we think about multiple falls which is falling two or more times what we've found in our study is that about 44 percent have multiple falls in any one year um, and when we think about people without dementia, about 17 to 22% have multiple falls, so two or more falls in each year. Um, and Michelle touched on some of the reasons why that might be, but this is just to show you. So we've got our brain and it's our big um, you know, computer processor. And then the brain gives our muscles messages to tell us what to do and how to move. Um, and then those muscles give our brain feedback, but we also get feedback from our eyes, our vestibular system, um, and our sensory nerves in our feet and limbs and those sorts of things, as well as in our joints. And they all help to keep us upright. And then what you can have is you can have a stimulus where you trip, and then you need a very quick response, as Michelle said, to be able to respond to that, whether it's a nudge from someone or, or a trip, um, to be able to then carry out the right actions to then keep you upright. And if everything doesn't come together in a timely manner, what can happen is we can fall. So we've done this is sort of a bit of a summary on some of the things that we know are full risk factors for people um, and some of these uh, the medical condition side of things have been probably found more in people without dementia than with dementia but we do know that things like arthritis stroke those sorts of things incontinence can increase your risk 
um, of falls. But often those things are things that we can't change. So when we do our research, we try and think about, well, what are the things we can change? It's good to have an understanding of what might cause falls, but what are the things that we can impact on that might be able to help us prevent falls? So other things um, that can increase your risk of falls is depression, anxiety, fear of falling, um, acute confusion or delirium, um, as well as we know that, as I showed you on the previous slide, that dementia can increase your risk of falls. And in people with dementia, what we found is that things like executive function, which is the planning and problem solving, um, if you have problems with executive function, that can increase your risk of falls. Processing speed, so that's a little bit along the same lines as reaction time. So our ability to process information and then be able to come, come up with some sort of response. And then visuospatial ability, so knowing where we are in space and being able to perceive our environment and those sorts of things. If you have any problems with those domains, it can increase your risk of falls. In terms of physical function, um, so in people without dementia, we know that balance is a strong risk factor for falls, and it's also a strong risk factor for falls in people with dementia. Um, other things that we've found is reaction time, walking speed, um, function, and those sorts of things. And physical inactivity has also been shown to increase your risk of falls. And one study found that people who were more physically active, it was actually protective against falls. Okay, so in terms of medications, now don't anybody go out and stop your medications based on this. Um, let me start by saying that. But if you ever wanna change any of your medications, you need to have a discussion with your doctor. Um, but what we have found is that people who take a lot of medications that can be associated with an increased risk of falls, and there's really good evidence generally that centrally acting medication, so that's medication that acts on the brain, um, can increase your risk of falls. And there's a couple of studies in people with dementia that have also shown that. But the, some of the studies that are done in, in big populations have also included people with dementia in their studies. Um, I guess... The taking lots of medications we need to be a little bit careful of because that can also be a sort of surrogate measure of the number of comorbidities or the number of other health conditions the person has so um, you know and there's not always we can't always show a direct relationship um, when we look at research and then finally environmental hazards so there's not a lot of evidence for environmental hazards as a risk factor for falls in people with dementia. It hasn't been studied a lot, um, but it does make sense if there's poor lighting or if you can't see the step edge, you know, that those things could increase your risk of falls. And what it probably is when it comes to the environment is it's a mix of everything. So it's a mix of the person in the environment, whether they're distracted at the time, you know, whether a dog's run through their legs and then they've, you know, missed the edge of the step or, you know, there's lots of things that come together when we think about environmental hazards. So it's not just the hazard, it's the person in, in the hazard or experiencing the hazard. So I'm going to move on to falls prevention and I'm not going to tell you about all the studies. I'm just going to, I've just picked a couple of studies um, and then I'll give you a bit of a summary of what we know. So this is the only, well, it's not the only randomised control trial now, there's one other, but this is a big trial. It was 270 people with Alzheimer's disease who were over the age of 65 who lived in Finland. And there were three arms to the study. So there was one group that just got usual care and there was one group that did home exercise and there was one group that did group-based exercise. Now, the exercise was two hours twice a week for 12 months, okay? So quite a big dose, and it was supervised by a physiotherapist. So a physiotherapist either went to the person's home twice a week for um, an hour each time for 12 months, or the person went to a day centre for four hours but did on average one hour of exercise while they were at the centre. And what they found, the, the type of exercise, they did a 
multimodal exercise, which is what Michelle mentioned before, where you do lots of different types of exercise. So they did endurance, balance, strength, dual task. Um, and they found that they had a really good reduction in falls, particularly in the home-based exercise group. The group, the group based exercise did also have a reduction in falls, but not as strong as the as the group based as the home based exercise. But quite an intensive program where the physiotherapist was providing two hours of supervision to the person's individualized exercise plan every week for 12 months. So in Australia, we've recently published this trial, which Professor Jackie Close was the um, lead investigator on and I've been involved with. So again, we had people who were over 65 years or older and they had, it was a combination of an exercise program and a home hazard reduction program. So it involved a physiotherapist and an occupational therapist. So for the dose, it was variable. It depended on the person um, and the prescription of exercise depended on the person as well as whether they needed um, supervision for their exercise. So the caregiver's availability and those sorts of things. It was tailored to the individual and there were 11 visits over the 12 months. So a bit less than one visit a month. And the visits were he more heavily, I'll show you on the next slide, but the visits were a bit more heavily weighted in the beginning to try and get people up and up and going with an exercise program and to make some changes around their home if the occupational therapist identified anything that could be improved or any strategies that could be um, used to try and um, improve people's ability within the home. But unfortunately, the overall results show that the program did not prevent falls. It did not prevent, it did not reduce what we call the rate of falls, so the number of falls over the 12 months period. But it may reduce the risk of multiple falls, so that's having two or more falls. But we need to be a little bit careful with this um, analysis because it did adjust for some factors that we found were different between the group that did and didn't receive the intervention. Um, and the jury's out about whether that should actually be done. So, but what we did find is in subgroup analysis where we looked at people with better physical function, that they did have a significant reduction in their, in their number of falls. So, the program or the intervention seemed to work in people with better physical function, and that was measured at baseline. And then down the bottom there, you can see an, an example sort of intervention schedule, and there's, there's weeks um, along in the blue arrow, and then down the bottom, the green is OT and the yellow is physiotherapy. So there are a couple of OT visits early on, followed by some physio, um, and then there are another one or two OT visits followed by um, a few more physios. But you can see the orange marker here is for the first six months of the study. And then the orange marker at the end here is the 12, final 12 months of the study. So there were really only a couple of physiotherapy visits in that second six months of the study. So in summary, and this is not just based on the two studies I've shown you, but based on some work that we've just been undertaking and it's not published yet, um, but looking at one of those summary type statistics where we look at all the interventions that involved exercise in the community and give a, a summation of whether it prevents falls or not. And what we've shown is that, yes, exercise probably does prevent falls in people with dementia who live in the community. It probably needs to be the right type of exercise. Um, so balance, strength, functional type exercise. And when we think about dose, so the, fin the Finnish trial had quite an intense dose and showed a really strong reduction in falls. So, but we probably need a bit more work in terms of research to understand what dose is required. So two hours twice a week from a physio for 12 months, I think is in Australia going to be a hard push to get a government to fund. So we probably need to look at trying to find a sweet spot where we can manage to implement and it's feasible to implement um, 
you know, but and we showed with a less intense dose that in people with better physical function, we could still get a reduction in falls. So we need a bit more work done on dose um, and to understand what, what we need to do there. And I should just say that most of the work in community has been done in people with mild to moderate cognitive impairment or mild to moderate dementia. So most studies exclude people with severe dementia. So we can't say whether exercise would prevent falls in that group. And I've put there better physical function. Maybe it works for people with better physical function because when we looked at one of the assessment scales that we used in our study and compared it to the, um, the same um, outcome that was used in the Finnish study, what we found is that our people with better physical function were similar to the Finnish group. And so maybe it is in people with slightly better physical function and not the frailer end of the population. But again, there's still more work to be done to fully understand um, how exercise um, can prevent falls in people who live in the community with dementia. And there are so many other health benefits to exercise. But as Michelle said, you need to choose what type of exercise you're going to do for what you want to achieve. So I'm just going to briefly touch on um, falls in prevention in residential care. So this is another trial that was done in Australia by Jenny Hewitt. Um, and it's called the Sunbeam Trial. And it was a progressive resistance training program for one hour twice a week for six months. And it also included balance and functional type exercises as well. So for the first six months, it was physiotherapy supervised group-based exercise in residential care. Um, and as I said, they had two hours twice a week of resistance training and they used those special machines that you can see in the picture up there so that it wasn't just any old strength training they had fancy machines that that helped them do it um, and then for the second six months of the trial it was two times 30 minute sessions um, and they were supervised by care staff at the residential care facility and the study showed that there was a great reduction in falls as well as fall related injuries and about 50% of that sample had cognitive impairment. So I, listening to Jenny, I was like, Jenny, what about looking at people with cognitive impairment within your sample? Because um, I wanted to see whether in that subgroup um, there was a reduction in falls. And so this is preliminary work because it hasn't been published yet. So it can always change because it depends on what um, other review, other researchers who give critical review of what we submit say. But what we found is that the program had similar fall prevention effects in people with cognitive impairment um, who lived in residential care. And we also showed that it can prevent fall injury in this group and improve physical function in this group. So positive um, outcome from that trial, but as I said, it's preliminary. So it, the results could change. It depends on what the reviewer says. But when we look at the summary, so I said we were doing that summary statistic before, there's less certain evidence overall for exercise for people with dementia who live in residential care to prevent falls. So there's always all the other added health benefits of being physically active. Um, and again, it's we probably need a bit more information on dose and intensity. So the intensity and dose of the trial that I just talked about, which was successful at preventing falls, was quite intense. It was for quite a long duration, quite an intense program over six months. Some of the studies that haven't worked have been shorter so there might have been an intent during the time, but people weren't getting the same dose of exercise. So again, I think we need a little bit more work to understand about the dose of the exercise and how much we need to have um, an effect on falls. And I'm going to finish there. So thank you. And um, I'll also say thanks for having me along and pass back to Michelle. There's also been some great uh, chat going on. Um, and I think the key thing that's coming out of the chat actually is that uh, people are exercising in all sorts of ways, dance, um, Pilates, bike. Um, and it's great to see that people are going to groups because I think groups can really help with motivation, but they're also um, social as well, which we know is really great for the brain. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up with some um, specific tips and direction for future um, work. Um, so really the tips I think 
is that you really need to find something that you that you like. So if it's um, if you're a health professional, it's really understanding um, the person's likes and dislikes. Um, it may be understanding their 24 hour routine. There may be a better time um, for someone to do physical activity, depending on that 24 hour routine and symptoms. Um, and really important to work with the family as well, um, but being mindful that um, it can be an extra thing that the maybe the carer or the person's family um, have to, to do during the day. Um, music can be a great one. Um, someone mentioned dance and um, that can be a great one to just um, get people feeling happy and want to be moving about. Um, if someone's been a gardener, um, that's another way of just doing incidental physical activity and getting out there. And it's just such a great um, thing that we've, we've used a lot actually in rehab. So when people are in hospital, um, we often get people out into the hospital garden um, and then grow their own vegetables and then use it for, for cooking as part of rehabilitation. So it's a great one as well. Um, not only does exercise need to be tailored in terms of balanced strength to the person's needs, but it's good to also um, consider the person's um, cognitive strengths and weaknesses. So if someone is having difficulty uh, with memory, then just providing written material, um, more repetition and one stage instructions um, and not overwhelming the person can be really important. If attention and fatigue is an issue, short but more frequent sessions can be useful um, and giving the person time to respond and not rushing and giving all the answers or giving too much information. Um, if executive function is a problem, which can be about judgment and planning, um, may need to have greater attention to safety when delivering an exercise program, but also assisting in planning when to do an exercise program. We all have trouble with motivation and planning when we're going to do it. And so people may need more assistance. If visuospatial function is an issue, then considering the environment, um, not too cluttered, not too many patterns and colors, um, and it may be actually giving some um, visual cues. And then motivation, I think we already talked about, but using functional activities um, is useful, things with a purpose, groups and music. Um, I've just popped down the bottom there. Um, these are some sheets that have been put together by La Trobe University. They're called MaxCog, but they're really strategies for both um, the person with the cognitive impairment and family um, on strategies, not about particularly about exercise, but how to um, help someone with different cognitive impairments. And I think they're really, really great um, that have been put together. So when should rehabilitation um, occur? And so um, Morag um, mentioned that, you know, early on when physical function was better um, might be more effective, but really rehabilitation can occur um, at any time through a person's journey. Um, we often think of rehabilitation after a specific event, such as a hip fracture or a stroke, and there is Unfortunately, some evidence that people with dementia do not receive um, as high a quality of care as people without dementia, um, despite their ability to improve. And so I think that's something that's really important that we need to um, get that message out. But rehabilitation, um, personally, I think should occur um, as soon as possible. Um, and so if someone attends a cognitive clinic, then it's something that should be offered to that person if they want it. Um, the type of rehabilitation may change um, depending on the severity. And so um, I'm, I'm thinking of um, diseases like Parkinson's disease where potentially early on training may involve dual task training. I think that could be similar in dementia, although there is um, limited evidence at the moment, whereas the strategies that are used later on may be different. And so I just wanted to... Um, talk a little bit about some um, work in motor learning. It's still very, um, the evidence is not strong, but these are some of the suggestions that potentially as people progress and have more difficulty in learning new skills that can be used. So I guess what I'm saying is we really need to tailor it to the cognitive strategy. So normally when we learn a new skill, we learn by um, practice and making errors, um, we're paying attention to the skill that we're doing um, and eventually it becomes automatic. But there is some thought that um, 
when people are having more difficulty with learning, it may be that we try a different strategy. And so this is called implicit learning. Um, and where you actually teach someone the skill without letting them make any errors. Um, and so if it's um, practicing, for example, standing up out of a chair, you do not let them make um, any errors in, in practicing that skill. Often when we teach someone a new skill, we also um, give a lot of variety. So we might change the height of the chair, we might use different chairs, but um, if the disease is more severe, then we might wanna try and keep the practice as constant as possible and use the person's chair that they're actually going to get out of all the time at home, so in their own environment. I mentioned short, frequent, um, but still high repetition practice would be important um, with frequent feedback, both being visual and positive. There is another um, technique that is sometimes used called spaced retrieval, retrieval. So if you're trying to teach someone a skill, it might be that um, they might need to remember to put the brakes on the walker or to use the walker. And you give them lots of prompts um, at short, intervals and then those intervals can get longer and longer as they um, might remember how to do the activity. Um, so I'm just going to, um, I think this is my second last slide, um, just finish up. I have a PhD student who's really looking at this topic in physiotherapists at the moment, um, looking at their knowledge, confidence and attitudes to working with people with dementia and we've just finished doing a systematic review in the area and um, Overall, we found that um, the knowledge and confidence of physiotherapists in working with people with dementia generally um, could improve, um, particularly around communicating with people, knowing what cognitive strategies to use and how to manage um, some challenging behaviours. And so I think there's really a lot of work to be done. Um, the other aspect is attitudes, and um, I think there's still a lot to be done, and it did come out in the systematic review, but we don't know, or generally there is not a lot of knowledge about the evidence um, and what can be done in terms of rehabilitation with people with dementia. And I think it's um, something that, um, Kate, I know you've really um, driven, and I think it's fantastic, but I think we've still got a long way to go with um, a lot of health professionals. and so. I think the real challenge now is changing health professionals' beliefs and attitudes, but it needs to be wider than that. We need to get it out to sports and leisure clubs, to the, um, you know, bowls clubs, gyms, golf clubs, whatever. Um, but also to people living with dementia and their families so that potentially when they go to cognitive clinics, they're asking about rehabilitation. So getting it into the minds of um, the health professionals working in the clinics as well and just the general public. And so hopefully the... Um, final goal and outcome will be that um, we'll be able to maintain function, but most importantly, participation with people with, um, living with dementia. Um, so thank you so much for listening. Um, hopefully we haven't gone too over time and I'd just like to acknowledge, um, particularly the Australian government that um, funds my fellowship. Um, my fellowship is a dementia fellowship and Morag um, has just finished one as well. And, it's unusual for physiotherapists to get fellowships in the area of dementia. And so I'm extremely grateful for that as well. Thank you so much.